Okay, so today our discussion will be exam-based uh, discussion on theatric trauma, trauma review. And uh, we'll discuss some testable items uh, which help you in the exam. Uh, basically, uh, the trauma is taken as evident from the adult. The same adult trauma, there are some differences in theatric trauma which are tested in exam. So this discussion will be precise, uh, interactive, and will help you in the exam. So uh, we will discuss the basic concept and the differences in management when compared to the elders, and will be precise and interactive. So regarding the epidemiology, pediatric patients, uh, pediatric population is more prone for fractures, uh, fractures because of low mineral content than elders. Associate conditions which increases the risk, CP, polio, neuromuscular disease, oxygenous imperfecta, birth and trauma. And remodeling is better than elders. Uh, so Satish, what are the differences which are different in an adult bone and a pediatric bone? What are the differences in general? <coughs> Sir, uh, pediatric bones are more elastic compared to adult bones. Yeah. They have they have a very thick periosteum compared yes. to the adult bones. They have a low uh, mineral content. Yeah, very good. Okay, what else? Ossification, they have, not visible they have on very, cartilage, uh, yeah. thick cartilage. Yeah. What else? Uh, they have very good uh, remodeling potential. Yes, what else? On the ligament, what is the what is the difference? Uh, ligaments are much less compared to the adults. So ligaments are injured more commonly, or the fracture happens. Evolution fractures. Happen. Uh, evolution fractures, sir. Evolution fractures. So this is the differences which are uh, different in a uh, pediatric population than compared to the adults. They have a thick cartilage, so it cannot be imaged on X-ray. They have a thick periosteum, so heals rapid. If someone asks you what is the which which part of the periosteum is thick, it is the cambium layer of the periosteum which is thick. Uh, they have more collagen, they have more cancellous bone, so simple fracture patterns happen, and they have the growth plate which remodels. And ligaments are stronger, so they bone fail first. So I will ask you again, same Satish, because I couldn't hold you on the first question. How can we pay the managed by different than Adams. And pediatric uh, fractures have a good uh, remodeling potential uh, compared to adults. So uh, protocols for the management of pediatric fractures are somewhat different compared to adults. Yes. So the difference is healing is rapid, remodeling is better. There are simple fracture patterns, avulsion injuries more than ligamentous injuries. So what factor in pediatric population affects the remodeling? Uh, first is age. The younger the age, more remodeling will occur. Second is the growth, fact, uh, growth plate. Near the growth, growth plate, the fracture will remodel effectively. Third is angulation. Angulation in the plane of the joint movement will remodel more precisely. Uh, and any fracture involving the joint or the growth plate will not remodel. So any fracture around at, on the growth plate should be, should be reduced perfectly. Does the rotation remodel? No, sir. No. Yeah, we, we take as rotation cannot remodel. It can remodel to some extent, but in exam purposes, rotation does not remodel at all. So regarding the proximal felix fractures, in less than 10 years, 10 to 20 degree angulation is accepted. In more than 10 years, 10 to 15 degrees of angulation accepted. Metacarpal neck fractures, 30 to 40 degree angulation is accepted in less than 10 years. And the shaft of metacarpal, we don't have good data regarding that. Uh, the greatest remodeling potential is distal radius. And the uh, Atkin showed that 50% displacement of the fracture fragment can be expected to remodel completely if there is at least one and a half year of growth remaining. So 10 years or 9 years or 11 years, 13 years, 14 years, these patients can remodel. I'm talking about a boy. If female comes, then it should be up till 12 years. So they can remodel effectively. 
this is the data of the uh, radius and ulna fractures. Um, if you see less than nine years of child, up to 15 degree of uh, mid shaft fractures can be taken as conservatively. More than nine years, 10 degree of angulation is taken as conservatively. And even complete displacement can be can can heal. So regarding the radial neck, the consensus is that less than 30 degrees should be accepted as a safe cutoff. More than that, you have to reduce it. Uh, you can reduce it by different ways because I'm not discussing radial neck fractures, but you can reduce it by the Patterson technique or uh, either by the K wire, it's called Metazio technique. Humeral shaft fractures, they, they can be, uh, actually the data is from the known and Sarwark and the various angulation of 20 to 30 degree of humeral shaft fractures can easily be uh, easily remodeled. And uh, uh, anterior angulation of 20 degrees, loss of internal rotation of 15 degrees is no problem. And bionet shortening of two centimeters is also acceptable. Regarding the proximal humerus fractures, up to 70 degree of angulation in less than five years is accepted. From five to 12 years, 40 to 70 degree angulation is accepted. And more than 12 years, up to 40 degree of angulation displacement is accepted. So in adult population, it again comes as near as postulated. After 14, 45 degree of angulation and two centimeter displacement, one centimeter displacement, sorry, is accepted as a displaced fracture and need to be reduced. This is a shaft of femur fracture. Um, from birth to two years, any various of valgus of 30 degrees accepted. Two to five years, 15 degree of angulation is accepted. Six to 10 years, 10 degree of angulation is accepted. More than 11 years, five degree of angulation is accepted. So divide into five, up till five, five to 10, and more than 10. So 15, 10, and 55. Remember this at this. Keep your shaft fractures. Um, the data is that various and vulgus of five degrees accepted in the uh, less than eight years old. Various of 10 degrees, anterior inclusion of 10 degrees, posterior inclusion of five degrees, shortening of 10 mm and rotation of five and five degrees. In your exam, if you have a 10 year old child and having a vulgus angulation, uh, you should avoid saying that. Because um, vulgus in some books is not accepted at all. So regarding the Salter Harris classification as the physis is mostly involved in all the fractures, most of the fractures. So we should discuss Salter Harris. This is the uh, simple classification which you should remember to get a pass. Uh, the type one fracture is uh, going through the physis. Type two fracture is going through the physis, going into the metaphysis. This component is named as Thurston Holland component. Uh, type three fractures are going to the physis and into the joint. Type four are, are crossing through the uh, through the physis and type five are compression fractures of the physis. So the in addition to Salter Harris, there are some. Uh, scientists which have declassified that was Rank, Ogden, and Peterson. So, if you see the first five classifications one, two, three, four, and five, but we get, went to six, this is a pericardial ring injury uh, devised, divide, uh, devised by Rank. Uh, this is a trauma to the epiphysis, this is devised by the Ogden, uh, it's called type six, type seven fracture, trauma to the epiphysis or osteochondral fractures. And this is fracture of the metaphysical region, type set, type eight, and type nine is avulsion injuries. There are many other classification systems. Most of the classification systems are those um, after Salter Harris. They are not involving the physis, but affecting the growth of the physis. So they are part of the modified Salter Harris classification. Ahmed Jamal, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. This is the diagram of a physis. If someone shows you this and ask you where the fracture, Salter Harris fracture occurred. Yes, sir. Any idea? Uh, uh, sir, it mostly occurs in the uh, hypertrophic zone. Zone of provisional calcification. Zone of provisional calcification. Why it occurs in zone of provisional calcification? Why not in any other zone? Uh, Why it occurs is the same concept. Um, basically, we are going from malleable physis yes, 
soft vices to a hard vices, and the zone of transition is more prone to injury. So, zone of provisional calcification, always remember this, this can be tested on exam. So, just regarding child abuse, um, um, Ahmed, how will you find out if the patient is having child? How, where, which of the findings would make you suspicious about child abuse? Uh, sir, uh, on X-ray, there are uh, multiple fractures in various healing stages. Yes. Uh, uh, sir, any other uh, on clinical examination, any other uh, sign of uh, any other bruise or any other sign of violence? Okay. Uh, 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 sir, uh, rest is the some bones are more commonly uh, injured in child abuse patients, like for example, tumor or tumorous. Uh, tumorous can fracture anyway. Why don't you talk about the ribs? Oh, ribs okay, sir. Fracture. What else? So I, I think you have covered most of the times, most of the things. Uh, first is that remember that uh, in a, in a inadequate, inconspicuous history is the most important finding. Multiple abrasions of different ages, multiple fractures of different ages, uh, multiple contusions and corner fractures of metaphysis are, you can suspect that they, the patient has, uh, you, you should have suspicion of having child abuse. For example, you have a patient in the ER who is coming with child abuse, you are suspect, suspect child abuse, whom you will inform? Uh, sir, the uh, hospital uh, inquiry committee or uh, some sort of uh, like uh, which involves the police or uh, uh, any other security agencies okay. as per the rules of hospital. Yeah. As per the policy of the hospital, you inform the social welfare or the non-accidental entity. Okay. 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 So regarding this fracture of the clavicle, mostly are managed conservatively in the pediatric population. It's middle one third is more common. Remember the sleep fracture. This can happen um, in different type of mechanisms and different type of fractures. But middle one third is still common, as per similar to adults. Uh, sleep fractures, pseudo paralysis in the newborn with birth injury can have, can come to the ER. And fracture uh, patterns should also include the medial clavicle physal injuries and distal clavicle physal injuries. So. Uh, Distal clavicle pediatric fractures are uh, fall or outstretch hand or direct blow. Uh, childhood equivalent to adult AC separation. And uh, periosteal sleeve attached to the AC and periclavicle ligament, so they heal quite nicely. And you have to do assessment, you have to obtain AP and Zanka view to help you identify the injury. However, what is Zanka view? Any idea? So it is 30 degree cephalid view of the clavicle which okay. awards the overlap of lungs over the clavicle okay and uh, what is it used for especially for ac joint injuries okay it, it, it is 10 degree catholic with 50 degree penetrance and at the level of ac joint and it is used for ac joint as well as distal clavicle fractures so here we are showing that the the lateral one third of clavicle fractures in pediatric population can be managed conservatively as there is periosteal sleeve and which is, which is parallel or attached to the clavicular or and, and acromioclavicular ligaments and so heals very nicely. And the part of the bone which you can see over here, this will be resolved with the passage of time for sure. So treatment is by sling immobilization and uh, surgery is rarely indicated and is controversial. So, any one of you, what is this implant? This is intramedullary K wire, sir. K wire. What is this then? Clavicle hook plate. Very good. What is this? This is uh, interlocking IM nail, sir. IM nail for the clavicle. What is this then? Mm. Uh, pain, uh, yeah, it's pain, but it's it's called. It, there is a name for it. These, these are threads, small threads. There are larger threads. You push it in, but what is it called? It's called rockwood pin. Okay. Rockwood. Rockwood. Yes. <coughs> okay. Uh, Let me say one question. Mm. Yeah. Sir, what about uh, use of figure of eight vintage versus the yeah. polyslang? 
in the non in pediatric population in the pediatric population you can use a sling you can use a figure of eight does not matter most of them will heal very nice. this is a proximal humerus fracture um, Regarding the proximal humerus fractures, uh, these are physical or metaphysical fractures. Um, in less than five years old, mostly a Sartre has type one fractures, and in more than 12 years, Sartre has type two is common. And metaphysical fractures occur between the age group of five to 12. Who will tell me what is Lither Leaguer's elbow? Shoulder, not elbow. Elbow is easy, but shoulder. Satish, have you heard this name? Uh, sorry, sir. I haven't heard this. Emma, do you know this? What is little legal shoulder? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Sorry. This is basically indirect trauma injury or overuse injury. It's basically not a fracture. Uh, the patient will come up, pediatric population, having a shoulder pain. Basically, it is Salter Harris type 1 overuse injury. And there is a medial side widening of the physis and metaphysical changes. So always remember that this, you can be asked this question in a pediatric population. Little legal shoulder. So, how are, what are the forces acting on this fracture? Sir, there are deltoid forces, abductor forces. Okay. Yeah. What else? The deltoid is pushing it up proximally. The distal fragment is pushed up. Yes, the shaft of the. And what about the head? The head is rotated with the rotator supraspinatus and. Uh, supraspinatus can only rotate it if, the, if there is an injury to the uh, greater tuberosity or lesser tuberosity. If the subscriber is not working, then supraspinatus forces will be more and it will cause external rotation. This is internal rotation, adapted. So how will reduce this fracture? You get a five years old child with this fracture and your, your consultant wants to reduce this fracture. It should be fixed, internally fixed. Internal fixation should be done. Five years old kid, you will do internal fixation for a five years old kid? Uh, because this this won't come in alignment, sir, with the closed reduction, I think. It can come in. A, it's your thinking. You don't say that you, I'm thinking or uh, I suspect or my experience. These words are abandoned in exam. How you reduce it? Any idea? Okay. For example, you're doing pinning for this patient. Pinning. How will you reduce it? The close reduction and percutaneous. But how will you do close reduction? Tell me the technique. Traction counter traction first. No. There is something. So we'll ab abduct the arm. Okay, very good. We will abduct the arm and yes. we'll see under CM. Uh, yes. We will abduct, yes. then do the traction, then reduce the, okay. the proximal distal fragment and then ab adduct it back. Yes. Okay, so abduction is important. Remember this. Uh, remember the ossification appearances because greater tuberosity appears at one to three years and lesser tuberosity appears at four to five years. So difficulty in identification of these fractures in uh, in these age group before the ossification. How you classify proximal humerus pediatric fractures? Uh, the classification is called near uh, near and Horowitz classification. Grade one is less than five mm. Grade two is less than one third shaft width is displaced. Grade three is more. Uh, grade two is one third less than one third shaft width. Grade three is more than or equal to two third width, and grade four is more than two third width displaced. So on history, Zahid, what you will ask the patient regarding history and examination? We will ask uh, how old is the injury, how it happened, and um, the mode of uh, injury. Uh, what was the position of a hand or was what uh, means what trauma he got okay good. and also we'll examine for the nerves especially auxiliary nerve okay open or closed 
Okay. Yes. What else? You will do vascular examination? Yes, sir. Definitely. Neurovascular examination. So, done. Neurovascular examination. So, in the radiographs, uh, you should do standard AP lateral scapular Y view for X is reduced, and you should do contralateral shoulder for comparison. And remember the stress factors in athletes, um, as I told you, the uh, little legal shoulder. Uh, Glenoidal humeral dislocation are not common in the adult population. And measure the angulation of the fracture and displacement. Identify any pathological fracture if present. Classify it as per the newborn, acute fracture, stress fracture, pathological fractures. In the adult population, you can use the role of uh, ultrasound and get if there is any fracture and displacement. So, except angulation, as we discussed early, within uh, less than 10 years, any degree of angulation is accepted. 10 to 13 years, it's up to 6 degree of angulation, and more than 13 years, up to 45 degree of angulation, and two-thirds of displacement. So, if you have a four-year-old child with completely displaced proximal humerus fracture, your treatment should be conservative. If six years, seven years, eight years, five years, three years, two years, all of them are conservative, and they can give you a very displaced fracture and tell you, in the exam settings that what you will proceed with and the answer is conservative even without any reduction don't push yourself into reduction and don't push yourself for a ky fixation so indication for poor resection fixation is that uh, it should be under anesthesia fluoroscopy should under controlled environment and fixation or without fixation and if the patients are severely displaced, Horowitz type 3, or more than 66% of displacement, or more than 45 degrees of angulation, or less than two years of growth left. So, this is the probably percutaneous fixation with K wire. And uh, you should read this from Campbell the, the basic concepts of adult K wire fixation, the same percutaneous fixation, same apply for the pediatric population as well. So, I think we, we covered this on the previous slide. Indication for ORIF, severely displaced less than 13 years or four failed close reductions. Near Horowitz type 3, severely angulated fracture in more than nine years old, old child after failed close reductions. Open fractures, fracture situated with vascular injury and intraarticular displacement. So, shaft of humerus. How you manage conservatively? Uh, most of the fractures in pediatric population are managed conservatively. So techniques can be slings, swath, or cuff and collar, cooptation slip, splint, hanging arm cast, sarmento brace, whatever. And you will, uh, they can ask you when you allow range of motion exercise, it is two to three weeks. So what are the indications for shaft of humerus fracture? For ORAF, anyone? Sir, uh, open fractures of the humerus shaft. Yes. Uh, fractures associated with the uh, vascular injury. Yeah. Uh, segmental type of uh, fractures. Yes. Uh, fractures with a uh, floating uh, elbow and sensilateral adhesion of fracture. Yeah, very good. Definitely. And pathological yeah. fractures. Huh? Pathological fractures. Yeah. Bilateral humerus so, fracture. It may be relative indication, but uh, multiple injury patients, it will come in multiple injury patients. So open fractures, multiple injury patients, if slightly forearm fractures, floating elbow and a stated shoulder injury. Technique is a flexible IM nailing or interlateral plating, plate fixation. Uh, this is uh, basically a uh, elastic and remainder layer fixation. Uh, you, sh you should know the principle of this fixation. Uh, I will read it. This, I know this is a tibia fracture, but the principle, the aim of this biologically mini invasive fracture technique is to give a level of reduction and stabilization that is appropriate for the age of the child. So, ESIN is based on symmetrical bracing action of two elastic nails um, inserted into the metaphysis, each of which bear against the inner bone at three points. So, basically, the principle is three point fixation. And the produce, this produces the following four biomechanical properties flexural stability 
axial stability, translation stability, and rotation stability. All four are essential to achieve optimal results. Another way is called bundle pinning. This is basically C or S shaped K wires or the nails acting like a spring. Principle induced by Hackethal, and many pins are inserted into the bone until jammed into the metal cavity to provide compression between nail and the bone. So the mechanism of this is different than the than the three point fixation for the elastic medullary nails. Uh, fractures around the elbow. Remember the ossification centers. It can be remembered by cricol or crito. Uh, capitulum at year one. Uh, radial edge at year three. Internal epicondyle at year five. Trochlea at age seven. Olecranon at nine. 11. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. So always remember it. So you have to sometimes uh, the in the exam they can ask you to draw lines or identify the findings. Where is the coronite process? Where is the capitalium process? Uh, capitalium, where is the olecranon? And then your discussion with the supracranial fracture may start. So supracranial fracture is basically uh, the epidemiology is five to seven years, male to female equal incidence, and the injuries uh, fall on an outstretched hand. So, what are the types of supracranial fractures? Sir, flexion and extension types. Sir. Excellent, excellent. You have to remember this because sometimes you will directly jump into Gartland classification and he has to ask you something else. So, which one is more common? So, flagged type uh, compromise almost 95% of supraconal fractures. Flexion or extension? Sorry, sorry, sir, sorry. Extension type. Sorry. Extension type. Okay. And flexion type, how many uh, percent? Three. They Two count percent. about three, 3 to 5 percent. How will you classify <laughs> the extension type? Uh, as per a uh, Gartland classification system, which okay. classifies uh, these fractures in three main groups. Uh, yeah. Type one are the undisplaced supracondylar fractures. Yeah. Uh, yes. Type two fractures uh, have intact uh, posterior cortex. Hinge. Periosteal hinge. Yeah. Yes. They, yes, they hinge on the posterior cortex. Periosteal hinge. And uh, type three fractures are completely displaced fracture. Okay. So Gatlin has classified this. There is an A and B into type C. Type 3A, type 3B. One is posterior medial, other is posterior lateral. I will not go into the modified gut length. So one can be managed conservatively, two can be reduced and can be either um, put in a cast or, a, or either percutaneous spinning. And type 3 can be also close reduction and pinning or plus minus ORIF. So this is the extension type uh, deformity. Sorry, extension type of supracanal fracture. Um, how will you reduce it? What, Sir, exam when, uh, what examination findings you will have? Should I just check the slide? So, for the, what examination findings? Uh, how first of all, besides the ATLS protocol, we have to check for distal vascular status of this patient. We have to check for a median, ulnar, uh, radial uh, status of this patient. Okay, which nerve most commonly in extension? Uh, uh, anterior antosseous branch of median very, nerve. Very good. Then, uh, then after. Uh, what you will examine? What else you will examine? Uh, we have to check for the any signs of compartment syndrome. Okay, but compartment syndrome will not occur that early if he comes within one hour. Why don't you check the vascular status? Pulsation? Yes, sir. Just yes, sir. First, first of all, we have to check for the vascular status, distal radial and ulnar pulses. So, always remember this. And in your exam, uh, there is a notorious type of question which comes. Uh, however, your mic is, is uh, many noises, however. So, Basically, in exam, you have a one scenario called S-shaped deformity. Remember that. Power. Power. Yes, I can hear too much noises from your side. Be careful. Uh, the the. Well, move the mic now. 
Yeah, but don't move the mic, mic then. Uh, the, 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 basically in your exam settings, there is one question which comes that there is a patient had a fall outstretched hand uh, or fall from a tree and then there is an S-shaped deformity in the elbow. S-shaped deformity is basically supracandular fracture, not elbow dislocation. So I asked, uh, what is the most common nerve injury in supracandular fracture? I think Satish already told AIN. What is the second most common nerve injury? Allah no, sir. What is the third then? No, no, no. Then Redel no. Redel no, third one. Okay. Okay. Redel. How will you investigate after supracranial fracture? You have a reduced fracture, supracranial fracture. After one day, the patient has an ulnar nerve injury or an anterior atrocious nerve injury. Uh, how will you assess him after one day? You will do nothing. Okay. These are mostly uh, practices and can be managed conservatively. Vascular injury incidents, they can ask you. So the most common nerve, which is the anterior atrocious nerve. Second most common is radial nerve. And third is ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve happens in the flexion types of the of fractures. Uh, so if you have a patient with a nervopraxia after supracranial fracture, you don't need to have further diagnostic studies. These are done after three to four weeks. A vascular compromise is five to 17%. Uh, what are the what will happen if the vascular compromise as their rich collaterals can maintain the circulation despite the vascular injury? So there is no issue. So they can ask you to draw angles around the elbow. The I think the most important would be Bowman's angle. This is basically my arrow is showing the modified Bowman's angle. This is the original Bowman's angle. Nowadays the the examiners mostly. Uh, Keep uh, remember this as Bowman angle, so it's, it should be compared with the contralateral side, and it should be six to eighty-one degrees. Always compare with the op opposite side. Other lines, uh, this is a tear drop. You have to assess it if in a cult fracture, supracranial fracture. This anterior humor line, which is mostly asked. There is one thing which it, I didn't draw over here is a Melgegni line, which can be asked in the exam to assess if there is a dislocation or there is a fracture. How to reduce supracranial fracture? Zahid, do you know how to reduce supracranial fractures? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, after sedation or analgesia, we uh, give linear traction and then oh. acute uh, stabilizing the distal humerus area and acute, acutely flexing the elbow. Okay. Then? And then check. Okay. If asked, they ask you what you will maintain first, length you will maintain first, or angulation you will maintain first. What you will maintain first out of these? Angulation. Length, sir. Length. Length. Okay. Good. You will do a traction. You will maintain the length. Then you will have a traveling maneuver to check the rotation. Okay. And then you see. This will be done in pronation or supination. Supination. Pronation. 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 Afterward. Reduction. Reduction. Reduction, sir. <laughs> Reduction. I think we, give, we give traction in the linear. Uh, the, the arm is uh, supinated when we give the traction. Okay. Okay. And acutely okay. flexed it, yes. He is right. Side is right. So, supination. Then we reduce it. Then, which position the elbow should be there? Supination or pronation? Then the elbow is pronation. pronation. Then pronation. So first of all, you do uh, in a supination the elbow. You do the maintain the length first. Then you correct the rotation deformity. Then you flex it. Uh, there is a word for a flexion, like extreme flexion, more than nine degree. And then you yes, pronate sir. it to lock it. Yes, sir. In the OR, you do an image for this. What is that image called? There is an X-ray shot to be taken at this position. In this position. Take an image. Elbow shoot through. What? Shoot through elbow. Through. I have never heard about this. Maybe you have read it somewhere. That's why you are telling me. It's called Jones view. Okay. Sometimes they ask in the exam. No, so okay. the muscle is the supracranial fracture is unreducible. Which muscle is interposed? Brachialis, sir. Very good. Okay, and the muscle is buttonhole. Which muscle is buttonhole? 
uh, tricep? No, same, brachialis. Yes. Both of them are brachialis. So, how you remove button holding? Basically, do milking maneuver. Okay, you milk up the proximal fragment and go distally and try to reduce it. The button hole. Okay, it's called milking maneuver. Uh, sometimes, actually, I'm telling you these things because supercranial fractures they will mostly be not uh, uh, asking bookish questions. They will be asking the those questions which are mostly done in your ER. So Thank you have you. to know these things. Yeah, clinical things. Yes. So we already answered the fracture is reduced now. How to avoid redisplacement? It is the pronation and flexion. Pronation, remember it. Okay, uh, after reduction, the reduction is unstable in ER. Now you have planned that I will go to the OR and reduce this fracture and pin it or open the reduction. How soon you will go to the OR? I would uh, like to fix the fracture as early as possible. Mm -hmm. If the fracture is unstable, I would uh, uh, like to pass percutaneous uh, K wires. Okay. But when? Uh, as early as possible, sir. Uh, prob uh, preferably with, uh, within six hours. Okay. Uh, uh, this is how soon you would like to fix it. Several retrospective studies of level three have compared less than eight hours presentation versus later, late more than eight hours after presentation. Treatment of close supercranial fracture without vascular compromise. Compromise showed no difference in complication, no compartment syndrome in either groups, and equal low rate of conversion to open reduction, pin fixation, and atrogenic nervitry. So basically, your exam answer will be that I will reduce it. I will keep the patient NPO. If the patient comes overnight, I will try to reduce in the ER, get an optimal position, put it in back slab, admit him, and tomorrow morning I can operate on him. If there is no war available. If there is emergency cases going on, you can tell him this is the answer. And no differences. So you want to pin it. Uh, you will do two lateral pins or medial lateral pin. Which pin, which fixation you would prefer? Sir, I, I would like to do two medial, two medial pins. Uh, so cross pinning? Uh, one minute. Satish, why you want to do two medial pins? May I know? Why two medial pins? Why not two lateral pins? What you want sir, to avoid? Uh, what you want, you want sir, to avoid medially, laterally, sorry. What you want to avoid laterally? I want to avoid the injury to the radial nerve, sir. But radial nerve crosses the lateral intramuscular system septum about three to five centimeter above the lateral epicondyle. It's very far. What else is moving around, roaming around near the elbow? What about ulnar nerve? Ulnar nerve. How much far is from from the elbow? Behind the medial epicondyle. Behind the medial epicondyle. Behind Very good. So, the basic concept of lateral pinning and medial and lateral pinning is that to avoid the ulnar nerve neuropraxia, which is 10%, 8 to 10%. So, which configuration is more stable? Either lateral pins or medial lateral pins? Which configuration medial is less? Medial lateral. Medial, medial, medial pins are cross pinning. Lateral. Okay, rotationally, the medial lateral bilateral pinning, both sides pinning is stable. But you can avoid by putting two lateral pins. The results are both for both of them are almost equal. Who is Hawaii P light? Please, Hawaii P light. Okay. Hawaii P light. Who is this guy? Yes, sir. Not from Apple. I'm listening. Much disnick or everything. You are disnick. You are not feeling well or what? Okay. Sir, I think it's his normal breathing. Yeah, but I can hear too much noises. That's the thing. Uh, okay. For example, you have a patient with a vest suspicion of vascular injury. Pink pulseless hand. Okay. The patient has no pulsations, but capillary fill is okay. 
what you will do. Observation. Pink pulseless hand. Uh, observation only. Duplex ultrasound. Sir, I want to reduce the fracture first, then okay. re-evaluate for the vascular status. Okay. You reduce the fracture, no pulses yet. What you will do? You will observe. You are right. Uh, you yes, have sir. to reduce the fracture. You have to is good. Then I will observe. Yes, you will observe. Okay, there is a poor perfused hand with absent pulses. What you will do? Then we can uh, get an uh, angiogram to see the vascular status. Okay. Then angiogram, what it will show? Uh, it will show the status of brachial artery, whether the, it is contused mm. or whether okay. there is a okay. okay. For both of them, your primary managers of the orthopedician is close reduction. You will not tell, I will do arteriogram, I will do angiogram, or I will do that, or I will call the vascular surgeon at once. The first prime model, first most important consideration for you is to reduce the displaced fracture. So in your exam settings, if you have a pink pulseless hand or a poor perfused hand with absent pulsation, your first job is to reduce the fracture, either in ER setting or the OR settings. Pin it. And then decide accordingly whether you want to shift this patient you want a muscular consultation or no. So we have two types of hands. Pink pulseless hand, you do close reduction to fixation. If pulse, pulse normally return in majority of the patients, if not, you have to observe. If poorly perfused, you do vascular consultation. Okay. For a poorly perfused pulseless hand, you again do the close reduction to fixation. Arteriography is never indicated. Restore pulses and observe. If poorly perfused, Again, do the vascular consultation, go on for angiogram. Okay? Did everybody understand? Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, sir after a vascular consultation, if uh, they are planning to uh, repair or uh, explore for the vessel, yes. uh, would we, we also? Uh, Put in the K-wires as well? Yes, you have to put a K-wire. Then there is an anterior approach for that. It's called Henry approach. You have to go through Henry approach and reduce the, put a K-wire and then do the arterial um, repair. Mostly there is no arterial injury. There is mostly intimal tears in this piece. I have never seen an arterial injury. Okay. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, have we... Did not we reduce the uh, poorly perfused pulseless hand by close reduction in terminal fixation? You will do close reduction in terminal fixation. It's written on. Yes, sir. We have already fixed it. Yes, if you have fixed it, that's it. He is asking me if you reduce the fracture and then still there is no pulsations. So, and you did vascular consultation. Yes, then if you are going to the OR, should we fix it or not fix it? You have to fix it because there is a hematoma which is drained out. You get me? So your answer in exam is close okay. reduction to fixation irrespective of arterial injury or there is a suspicion of arterial injury. Your job is to fix it. Fix it means reduce it. So you can reduce this in ER and decide whether it is you need to refer it to the vascular or not. So the complication, electrogenic ulnar nerve injury is 3 to 8%. Uh, we have never explored, explored uh, ulnar nerve injury, atrogenic ulnar nerve injury. Most of them are nervopraxias. VIC uh, can happen, occur, uh, cubitus varus can occur, vulgus deformity can occur, recurvatum can occur, and stiffness. So remember, do not jump into non union. Some of the people will ask you what is the complication of supracranial fractures managed conservatively without KY. There is nothing like non union. Okay? Most of them end up into mild unions. Sir, one other question. Uh, sir, sometimes we uh, apply a, a back slab in a full extension, uh, uh, seeing uh, the huge swelling at the elbow. And is it recommendable or recommended or not, sir? Can you repeat it again? What? You did what? Pardon, I could not hear you. Uh, sir, may I repeat? Sir, he's saying uh, that. Where there is a massive swelling at elbow, we apply a back slab, sometimes in full extension. Is it recommended? 
Actually, I've never applied a, a backslab in full extension. There are, uh, by the way, there are papers in full extension, backslab in full extension. Uh, there is a, if you, if you read the book history, there is one uh, uh, Sultanpur technique, Sultanpur of Bahrain technique. When they put a cast around the elbow, the humerus, reduce the proximal to the distal fragment and then flex the elbow. I have never done this. And I have never done a cast in extension. Maybe there will be articles, but in exam settings, they will not ask you that a backslab is done in extension. Yes, if you ha don't have the expertise to reduce a supracondylar fracture, you can put a backslab in extension and shift him uh, to the better settings where the operative direction. But we are talking about orthopedic surgery. So orthopedician should know how to reduce supracondylar fracture. I know the learning curve of supracondylar fracture is very long, but uh, you, you need to reduce more than 60 fractures to to be able to align a fracture perfectly. But yes, it, it, it is recommended that you should uh, reduce the fracture and put it in extreme flexion. <coughs> For example, if you do reduce a... Uh, this one... So basically, uh, I, I lost my track. Uh, Supracranial fracture, for example, Satish? Sir. Yeah, uh, if you do a reduction of a fracture and do flexion, extreme of flexion, and there is no pulsations, then what you will do? Then I will uh, reduce the uh, uh, flexion. Yes. Reduce the I will see. I will see where the pulses uh, come. Then yeah. I will uh, uh, immobilize in that position. Yes, good. Okay. So, medial epicondyle fracture. In your exam settings, basically, uh, medial epicondyle fracture will not come as medial epicondyle. Basically, the settings would be a dislocated elbow and then reduced and incarcerated elbow component or small chip fracture. They can show you uh, in testable items there is a post dislocation. You are called to the ER, and there is a uh, there is some uh, small bony fleck which is visible, or the fracture cannot be reduced perfectly, and you are asked to uh, review the X-ray in the settings. So in exam settings, remember that any incarcerated uh, uh, bony component you should suspect that there is, there is a medial epicondyle fracture. Uh, this is the X-ray. This is the elbow dislocation which has been reduced, and you can see small chip fracture which can be either from the uh, from multiple reasons, but the most important is the medial epicondyle. 20% uh, of all pediatric populations have medial uh, incidence, 9 to 14 years of age. Medial avulsion mechanism is vulgar stress with contraction of plexus supinator mass. Uh, displacing factors are anteriorly via tension created by flexor pronator mass and other collateral ligament. Associated with uh, elbow dislocation in approximately 50 to 60% of the cases. Fracture may remain incarcerated in 15% of the cases. So remember, any small fleck of bone inside the trap inside the joint, you should suspect medial epicondyle. Uh, regarding the radiology, AP lateral view, which one is better view? Internal or external oblique view? They may ask you. The best is the better is the internal oblique view. You cannot see anything in external oblique. So remember the internal oblique view in the medial epicondyle. Any one of you do you know how to reduce incarcerated medial canal fracture? Close reduction. Sir, so giving traction and uh, valgus uh, force and uh, observing it in under the siam. Yeah, this can happen. This 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 is one mechanism. Basically, the mechanism is called Robert Technique. Robert Technique, basically, they put a vulgus force, supinate, and extension of the wrist and the fingers. So the traction force on the flexor pronator mass will reduce the incarcerated uh, medial epicondyle. Other technique is Lohan Technique, Ishmark compression, soft tissue towards the fracture side. So basically, you take the Ishmark bandage and wrap him around to the, from the distally to the proximal end, and then it, 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 it can reduce. But if it's not reducible, then you have to do RF. 
So regarding classification, there is no um, classification device for this fracture. Either it can be undisplaced or minimum displaced less than 5 mm or displaced more than 5 mm, incarcerated without elbow dislocation, incarcerated with elbow dislocation, and chronic tension or stress injury. So undisplaced, you are immobilized for one to three weeks in long arm cast with elbow flex to 90 degree flexion. Um, amount of true displacement, by the way, is difficult to determine on radiograph, and this is controversial. ORF, absolute indications are displaced fracture with entrapped medial epicondyle fragment in the joint, extension to articular surface of medial epicondyle involvement, or open fractures. Uh, relative can be other nerve dysfunctions or 2 to 15 mm displacement. This is also controversial. So, complication regarding medial epicondyle. Uh, Cubits vulgus can occur, uh, nerve injury, uh, ulnar nerve injury can occur, radial nerve can be uh, at risk because of biparticle screw fixation, uh, it can be misincarcerated inside the elbow joint causing stiffness, elbow stiffness by itself, and pro prolonged immobilization uh, and non-union. So regarding the lateral epicondyle, uh, this is a fracture of lateral epicondyle, and uh, it most commonly occurs at the age of six years, around six years. Mostly a sartre has type four fractures. Two mechanisms are, one is pull-off theory and other is push-off theory. Regarding the pull-off theory, the evolution fracture of the lateral epicondyle that results from a pull of a common extensor musculature. And the other is push-off theory when patient fall outstretch hand. So this is the milch classification. I think everyone should remember it. Type one milch is of type four Salteres fracture and type 2 milch is Salteres type 2 fracture. So why, which one is, is, uh, is not good? By the way, both of them are not good for the elbow, but which one is, has more like complications? Two, sir. Type 1 has more complications than type 2. Okay, why one has more complications? Uh, more swear yes, injury. Type 4 to... injury, both metaphysical and epiphysical yeah. components are there. Okay. For example, one milch or two milch, both are displaced, and you want to fix both of them. And you fix both of them, which one will have more complications? Basically, the concept goes around the trochlear hinge. Okay. Whenever the fracture is involved in the trochlear hinge and reduces its, its length, it will hamper the elbow range of motion. So MILCH 2 has more complications. If you have a comminution tear fragment around in the medial aspect and you try to reduce it with the screws or anything, or a KY, for example, we are talking about periodic combination, uh, the, the complications will be more in MILCH 2 than 1. That's why milch 1 is type 4 and type 2 milch is, is basically type one type 2 fracture but involving the trochlear groove. There is another classification called the Kilfoyle classification. Actually, um, it's Kilfoyle, Jacob, Weiss. I don't know what is the name of this. Type 1 is undisplaced, type 2 is having periosteal hinge and type 3 is displaced fracture. <coughs> So for this also, you do AP lateral and oblique views. And the best view also for lateral epicondyle is internal oblique view, same as medial epicondyle. You can also do arthrogram, CT or MR studies if needed, but rarely indicated. So non-operative management, rarely you do non-operative management for these fractures. You put a long arm cast in four, for four to six weeks, and only in cases where there is less than two mm of displacement in all views, and there is a medial cartilaginous hinge, which means type 2 kill point. Um, you do weekly follow-up, weekly radiograph for three weeks, and including the internal oblique view. And the casting may need it to be more than six weeks. So uh, this is controversial. You don't do close reference percutaneous spinning for the lateral condyle because of the forces and the fragment is mostly rotated. Mostly you will go, go for ORIF for these fractures and put, in, put, put them in a cast. Uh, complications are same, similar to any fracture involving the joint. The 
the top most is stiffness, second is delayed union, third is cubitus virus deformity, and cubitus vulgus also. So lateral epicondyle can also cause, as we know that there is cubitus virus deformity, vulgus deformity, but cubitus virus can also occur with the lateral epicondyle fractures. AVN and fistial deformities also. Have you seen fistial deformity? Has someone seen? Yes, sir. Superconductor yes. fractures. Yeah, but what is fistial deformity? Any idea? The both there radial and lateral curve like overgrowth with center remains uh, behind. Yeah, try to see the radiograph. I think I have not uh, put this uh, fistial deformity radiograph. It's very like uh, quite uh, expressive radiograph big findings on that. So the this deformity is actually seen, seen in lateral views and it is caused by a rotation of the distal fragment and supracondylar fractures. No, that is not fishtail deformity. Google it. Okay? So the fishtail is seen in AP view, middle that and lateral condyle, both overgrow and center of the... Yes, yes. This is called fishtail Okay. Lateral overgrowth is the most common complication of lateral epicondyle fracture. Even if they are managed conservatively, there is a lateral sparring happens. And uh, uh, the patient should be counseled for it, even if the patient is, the fracture is reduced. The reason is that the that the, the the cause is that the the fracture has been how are your mobile is how are you using headphones? Uh, I am using sir. Yes, sir. How are you? Are I using headphones? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm using sir, headphones. Yeah, I don't know. You, you're, you're uh, too much noises from your side. So regarding forearm fractures, they usually occur fall from height. Uh, uh, most of them are managed conservatively and describes as apex volar or apex dorsal. What is cast index? Who will tell me? The cost. Index is basically if both AP and lateral view distance from the two cast tells. Okay. What it tells? How much should be the cast index? What is the optimal uh, cast index? Sir, it should be less than one. It should be 0.7. It should be less than one. 0.7. Somewhere you will read 0 0.8. Also. 0 0.7. Less than one. So, the concept is that a good cast should be applied. There should be three point molding. The ulna should be straight. The cast index should be 0 0.7. It should be high arm up and supination or termination depending on the level of fracture. Power, your. Too much noise is there. Okay. So, regarding deformation forces. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Excuse me, sir. Uh, can you repeat the cast index, please? Cast index or good cast? In cast, uh, cast index is, is basically it's, it's, it's visible on your uh, on the on, on the radiograph on the on the at the lateral view. You measure the the, the, the length of the cast and then uh, the height of the cast. And AP view you again measure the height of the cast and it's A divided by B is cast index. It should be 0.7. Somewhere you can read 0.8 also. So, if a proximal uh, radius fracture occurs, which position you will do the back slab, reduce the fracture? You have a, you have a proximal forearm fracture. You reduced it. The pronated, cast, right. cast should be supinated or pronated? Proximal. Pronated. Why? On the proximal third, we want to keep the forearm in pronation okay. because we want to relax the effect of. Uh, Pronator uh, teres. Okay. Why don't you supinate it? Supinate it. Okay. Listen. You. This. These are all in rock wood. Uh, proximal humerus. Proximal forearm fractures are 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 are, put, are placed in a cast in supination. The mid shaft are in mid prone, and the distal cast distal fractures are treated in pronation. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Proximal okay. is supination, okay. mid shaft is mid prone or mid supine, and the distal forearm fractures are in pronation. So, right. so regarding unacceptable alignment, falling close reduction, angulation of more than 15 degrees, rotation of more than 45 degrees at any child less than 10, 10 years, and angulation of more than 10 degrees or rotation of 30 degrees in any child more than 10 years. Or both arm fractures in more in less than 13 years. After that age, we manage the patient operating. Uh, you can you may be asked uh, you may be shown this radiograph and uh, and asked to to describe this. Who can describe me this X-ray? Zahid, can you describe this X-ray? Sir, it's uh, most probably a P view uh, of the forearm. Mm -hmm. uh, with the middle one third a fracture of the ulna, uh, which is angulated about um, 45 degree uh, towards the radius. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this, is of the radius. this lateral head. This sorry lateral view. Lateral view, okay. So what are your findings? Okay, well, I put this X-ray for two reasons. Uh, one is that they, uh, in the exam settings, they can put the X-ray in a longitudinal manner and it's very difficult to identify is AP view or lateral view. So first you have to correct the X-ray in the correct position. This is a lateral view of X-ray, about lateral oblique view. And you can see there is an anterior apex angulation of, uh, 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 of the ulna with a radial head dislocation. It's a more TGA type. Okay. Okay. So, Bardo classified uh, Montegia fractures. Uh, type 1 is anterior, type 2 is posterior, type 3 is lateral, with dislocation laterally, and type 4 is with radial diaphyseal fractures. So, the, what is the difference between the pederatic uh, Montegia is that they can be managed conservatively, not like adults. So, uh, proximal one third ulna fracture with a straight radial head dislocation instability. Peak incidence is 4 to 10 years of age. Uh, differs than adults and as they can be managed conservatively and ulna is the key. Once you reduce the ulna fracture, the, L, the radial head comes back into its place. Uh, always when you see a patient with the, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the ulna fracture, you should examine the elbow range of motion. And common scenario is that the patient has a pain injury and comes up with a posterior atrocious nerve injury and with the associated ulna fracture, you have to identify uh, the Montigi. Uh, uh, regarding the treatment, you can do a close reduction with cast, ORF ulna, or radial head as well. So first you reduce the fracture ulna, pin it with the elastic intermedial nail or, or plate it, and then you assess the radial head. Mostly it comes back into its place. Pain injury does not need any intervention. It, it's, it's resolved within two to three months. Uh, sir, I have to ask one question. Uh, sir, do we have to stabilize the radial head, uh, fix it with something, or just a no. ligament repair? No, no need to. No, no need to. They will ask, not ask you this question if the radial head. Mostly, you can give this answer that the radial head mostly reduces. If not, I will open it with a cocker cocker uh, approach, reduce the radial head, repair the annular ligament. That's it. Okay. If your radial head is not reducible or not reducing, this means that Allah has not been in a correct manner. It is not aligned. Okay. There is certainly some angulation which is reduced, which is not allowing the maintaining of the length of the forearm. So regarding the Galezi fractures, uh, Galezi is basically a, 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 a radius, uh, the fracture of the radius in the middle one third or the distal one third with the dislocation and stability of the distal joint. So incidence is that uh, regarding the incidence of uh, distal radial joint instability, if the radial fracture is less than is within 7.5 centimeter from the articular surface, there is a drudge, inst drudge instability in 55% in of the cases. If radial fracture is more than 7.5 centimeter from the articular surface, the instability is less than 6%. So you can attempt close reduction in in the in, in, in as as per Galizi uh, in, in Galizi also, but uh, it's not 
as successful as Montigia. And mostly you have to do open rational fixation for the distal radius and assess uh, for the distal radial joint supination. They can ask me this question, that's why I marked it red. So we go to lower limbs. Who we classify neck of femur fractures? So neck of femur fractures are Delbit classified as per a Delbert classification. Who classifies uh, this fracture to four major groups? Yeah. Uh, type one fractures are basically subcapital fractures through the growth plate. Uh, type two fractures are trans cervical through the middle of the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, type three fractures are uh, uh, cervical trochanteric. Mm -hmm. uh, type four fractures are uh, subtrochanteric fractures. Yes. So remember the Delbert classification. They can uh, give you a pedratic X ray and ask you what is the classification and don't jump into gardens classification. There is another for <coughs> fractures. So Delbit 1 is classified to A and B. A is with dislocation and B is without dislocation. So to assess it, you can do a plane radiograph AP and a cross table lateral radiograph. Don't jump into frog leg lateral. Frog leg lateral cannot be done in trauma patients. It's cross table lateral view. Then you can do a CT or MRI as if needed, but most of the times you don't need these images. For type one, transepiphyseal fractures, the treatment is close reduction and spica cast in dilatation in less than four years of age. If the patient is old and or the fracture is displaced, then you do close reduction or open reduction is performed to anatomical alignment. Then you could put the smooth, smooth pins or canated screw fixation in older age. In type 2 and 3 fractures, you do close reduction and spica cast immobilization for, for pediatric population less than 4 years or fractures are non displaced. Remember that type 2 fractures are. Are, are, are the trans cervical fractures and difficult to assess the displacement. So you can do internal fixation with smooth pins and can fixation can also be done in older population. Type 4 fractures are cervical trochanteric, just like synonym to the intertrochanteric fractures of the adult. And uh, the treatment is if it's undisplaced, you can put a, put a cast in with a spica cast, or you can do a close reduction and pin fixations in child up to six years, or otherwise, if, if if it's displaced and the child is adult, you can go through an interlateral approach and fix with a plate or compression hip screw. How many holes dynamic hip screw you will apply for a child of nine years old to reduce a type 4 delta? After two, 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 two plates. Two, 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 two holes. What, what, what about adults? Two, four. Yeah, no, two, 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 Problem is that we don't have availability in Pakistan probably of two hole teachers. And we are more confident with four holes. So, so right. this is the type of implant. Yeah, I have, have a question for type one delvic lesson. Yeah. Yes. So how can we differentiate between type one delvic uh, uh, transphysial and transphysial fracture and a scapy fracture? It depends on what? History. Yes, sir. History and age of the patient, especially. First is history. Second is age, type of trauma. Hmm? If patient comes at yes, the sir. age of four having a, a slip capital femoral epiphysis, you cannot jump it to Sufi because the patient is already just uh, at the age of three. Sufi happens at 10 or to 12 years of age. Yes, sir. I think Zayed has answered you almost. Zayed, what, how will you differentiate soup from type 1 transit You answered already, so just repeat it again. 
Yes, sir. Uh, sir, in Sufi, we mainly uh, receive a child of about 10 to 12 years, uh, mostly uh, fatty uh, boys. Uh, and there is not a history of uh, like uh, history of fall or something like this. He, he gets pain in the inguinal region uh, with some sort of movement. This is kind of like this. Yes. What type of movement causes pain, by the way, in soup? So, uh, flexion and external rotation? Flexion, uh, flexion and internal rotation. Internal rotation. Okay. Internal rotation. Yeah, normally the patient will come up, he will, when you ask him to walk, and when you try to examine the range of motion of the hip, you will find out that there is a reduced internal rotation. You ask him to squat, if it's stable, so it's too. And the patient will squat with external rotation. Okay. So, uh, our discussion regarding delpit ends with what is the rate of AVN. So type 1 approaches to 100% AVN. Okay. Type 2, 50% 50, 50 rate of AVN. Type 3, 20 to 30% rate of AVN. Type 4, 10 to 15% of AVN. Just remember this 100, 50, 25, and 10 to 15. They will not force you to get to the average. So 150, 25, and 15, 10 to 15. By the way, in many books, type 4 delbit has zero EVM. Some of the books have written, for example, Rockwood has written somewhere that the rate is, is nearly zero. So, fever or chef fractures can happen due to road traffic accidents, fall from heights, sports, and estate injuries. And uh, general principles, I will just uh, delineate the general principles. Uh, immobilization is tolerated very well in the lower limbs. Uh, stiffness is rare. Internal fixation should be avoided. They unite rapidly. Over growth of 1 to 2 mm is accept, expected. Uh, strong remodeling potential is available. And uh, angulation of less than of up to 15 degree in coronal and 20 degree sinusal is accepted. So, regarding treatment of uh, humeral shaft fractures, uh, 0 to 2 years of age, a uh, patient can be treated with pelvic uh, spica casting, direct spica casting, one and a half cast, or pelvic harness or gallow structure. Uh, Jahanzeh, what is this? A pelvic harness, sir. Okay, what are the components of pelvic harness? Um, a flexion strap, sir. Yes. And, uh, um, a thoracic component. Okay. And Abduction straps. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, and shoulder straps. Shoulder straps. Yes. And sh shoulder straps and stirrups. Yeah. So there is, if you can see this, there is a there is a stirrup over here anterior. What is it used for? What is this this one used for? This one. Uh, sorry, this one. This is strap is used for flexion of the hip. Yeah, Satish, like, like, I, I'm asking somebody else, so you should not answer. Okay. This is used for flexion. Used for flexion of the hip, sir. Yes. There is on the back, there is another strap. What is that used for? Abduction of the hip. Oh, yeah. So abduction strap. So there are flexion strap, which is which is present intermediately. And posteriorly, there is abduction straps. There is a shoulder stirrup uh, and uh, the component, which is called the shoulder component. And this can be used for a uh, femoral shaft fractures also. Uh, Satish, what is this? Uh, sir, I think this is a, a gravity traction costing. Okay, there is some name for it. Uh, yes. Gallows traction. Gallows traction. Okay. So, what's important in this traction? One is weight. You cannot use it for an adult population. This is a pediatric population. So, probably, it's a, I think, 12 kgs or 14 kgs is the maximum you can use scalar traction for, for femoral shaft fractures. And the important thing is that the buttock should be 2 to 3, three centimeters above the bed. Okay. 
Did you understood? Yes, sir. Yeah, the buttocks should be, there should be one finger uh, distance or two to three centimeters above the bed. The, 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 the buttocks should be above, it should be floating. So two to six years, you can do early spica or traction followed by spica. Uh, I don't remember, I'm not sure, but this is called Schollberger technique. Traction followed by spica. First, they maintain a traction as inpatient for one week. And then when there is a soft callus formation, then put him put in spine. Healing time. I can ask you, what is the healing time of fracture shaft of femur? So periodic shaft of femur, for example, the age is four. So four plus three, seven weeks. Age is five. Five plus three, eight weeks. And really, you can, uh, really, conservative treatment can fail. Uh, this is uh, uh, a short... Uh, 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 this slide I added because just to remember that less than six can be used pelvic harness or spica cast. More than six months, yeah, to five years, you can do the spica or traction. And more than five to 11 years, you can do flexible nail or spica. And more than 11, you can put a normal uh, locking nail. It's locking nail. Regarding supracranial fractures, uh, most common are Salteres type 2. And 30. Yes. Sir, uh, I have one question regarding uh, non-operative management of femoral shed fractures. Yes. Uh, sometimes we get uh, femoral shed fractures mm. that are uh, reduced and stimulated spica, mm. and we see some translation and shortening that is called biotite opposition. Yes. So, how much shortening is acceptable for femoral shed fractures? Actually, frankly speaking, uh, I remember a story regarding this. Um, one of a consultant, uh, actually uh, my, my supervisor, told me an interesting story that once I reduce a fracture, okay, and I reduce the fracture perfectly, and after the reduction, I showed the post of X, post reduction X-ray, and my professor told me you should have a bit, you should have made it a bit displaced instead of reducing it perfectly. So the problem with this is that the femoral shaft fractures, the, the problem is not shortening. The problem is lengthening of one to two millimeter, centimeter. So uh, in a periodic population, all, all depends on the age. If you have a six to seven years old, old of child and there is a bionic opposition or translation, I would accept two to three centimeter in no issue. Okay, but we discuss it in a slide also. That 20 to 30 degree of angle, any angle, any angulation is accepted within less than three years of age. You can just put a put a spiker without reduction in the and just go for the same. So uh, the thing is that reduction, perfect reduction of fewer shaft fractures should be avoided. Most of the fractures will heal, and they will uh, right, they won't have that. As I told you, the problem is with the lengthening. The fewer shaft fracture, the end result is lengthening in the adolescent population, like five, six, or seven years of age. So in this age group, you should avoid perfect reduction of fractures. Right, sir. And this is this is the thing noted by the parents always. They say that the bone is so wide apart and how you can say that it will, it will you can, unite. You can, you so can counseling also, is very important in this. For example, I had a patient who was only 15 days old, had a fall in a shaft of femur fracture within more than 40 degrees. And I told them that we will put a pelvic harness and it's okay. And it took five days to make it to have exuberant chalice clinically. Like I could not move the fracture site. So, yes, sir. And yes, um, the, 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 the mother or parents, they should be counseled. I, did, I found a distal radius fracture in my e training. It was completely yes, displaced. Sir. Complete displaced. And I sent this x ray to my consultant, my supervisor, and he told me to do nothing. And I just put a crab bandage around it and put an arm sling for it, made an arm sling for it. And after three days, when the patient came, there was no. And these patients, the fracture is very quite efficiently. Regarding supracranial yes. fever fracture, this is uh, very notorious for deformities and angular deformities. So 30 to 50% rate of physical injury arrest 
that often leads to growth disturbance and deformities. So uh, the radiograph you can do is AP lateral oblique use. You can do MR studies, ultrasound or CT scan to identify in pediatric population. Uh, sorry, ultrasound you can do in pediatric population. CT MRI is not, mostly not clean, only for a pulse fractures. Uh, for ORF indications, the salt has type 3 and 4 practice should be treated as adult population and should be reduced and fixed. And we are talking about the age like 5 to 12 years of age, not in pediatric, uh, in, in less than that. So irreducible fracture site has type 1 and 2 also can be, you can do fixation. And you should avoid the physis. Um, Faisal arrest is certainly an issue and the problem is that this can cause leg length discrepancy of angular deformities. So this slide is, uh, you should not remember it, but it's important. Limb length inequality of more than two centimeters can happen in one third of the cases, and it correlates with the fracture patterns. So Salteres type one can cause 36% of uh, limb length inequality. Salteres type two can cause 58% limb length inequality. Type three, 49%, and type four can cause 64%. So, uh, this slide is telling you the length, uh, the, 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 the exponential growth per year for, a, for the distal femur is 9 mm. And you should always remember it. It can be tested in the examinations because the distal femoral physal fractures can uh, cause bony bar, which can cause angular deformities and uh, limb length problems. 9 mm per uh, year. Uh, yes. Sir, I have to ask yes. one thing. Uh, sir, it is 9 mm per year through the whole growth period. Yes. Oh. As far as we remember, no, it is not basically uh, 9 mm, but for ease purposes, we, we remember it as 9 mm per year. Basically, the best way is to do mostly charting. Okay. Okay, sir. Or you, you know, after, and, and, and that charting you need, you needs to have a follow up for two to three times. You should have these x rays. And then you can identify how much length of growth is going to be. Uh, but normally it's very easy to remember this because if you have a patient with a distal femur fracture with a limb length inequality of 2 to 3 mm, so you can easily estimate that uh, four years, the patient has four years of growth remaining, for example. So you can do the epiphysiodesis on the opposite side, on the opposite aspect. And uh, um, and it was this on the other side also to keep the limb length uh, acceptable enough. So, regarding the Faisal bar resection, uh, if there is uh, when you should do resect the bar, if it's less than 50% of the Faisal bar or more than 2 or 2.5 centimeters, <laughs> more than 2 years or 2.5 centimeters of growth in any, you can resect the bar. After resection of the bar, what you will do? Any idea? A facial autograph or something? Uh, yes, what? Uh, Fill it with some, some yes. position of some material. Yeah, so you can pose with a fat. It, it does not depend what, what type of uh, stock tissue you can, or the, or the uh, artificial thing you can use. But you can, after a section, put, uh, put fat or muscle. Material. Most people will prefer fat. Uh, tibial size spine fractures. Uh, by the way, these are the very um, like if you see these fractures, uh, looks like very benign fractures, but operating these fractures is very difficult. Normally, it depends. If you have to do arthroscopic operative intervention, and it's classified by Meyer and McEwen. Anyone knows what is Meyer and McEwen? Uh, Can anybody know Meyer and Mickey web classification? Uh, I forgot that. Okay, what uh, tibial spine fracture comes to you in the clinic? Or tibial imminence fracture? Tibial imminence, okay. What are the examination findings? Sir, so there is special tenderness or pain in the tibial spine area or a mild swelling uh, maybe there. The range of motion of the knee is okay. You cannot palpate tibial spine. 
Oh, okay. Tubal spine. No, tubal tuberosity is different. Yeah, tubal tuberosity and spine is different. Tibial um, uh, spine fracture or tibial imminence fracture are classified by Meyer and Nikki. Where one is non displaced or minimally displaced. Uh, type 2 is having a type B is called having a periosteal hinge, and type 3 are complete displaced fractures. So, what are the examination findings in tibial spine fractures? Uh, there will be pain, swelling, and hemarthrosis. Hemarthrosis, I can accept. Increased range of motion. You cannot assess hemarthrosis clinically on examination if I don't give you a needle or you don't poke it with. What is attached to tibial spine? There will be swelling. ACL. ACL. So, how do you examine ACL? Draw test, sir. Draw test to Lackman. Okay, one minute, one minute. Lackman. Which one is better, Lackman or Drawer? Lackman. 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 Which one? Both Lackman is most sensitive and most specific also. So yes, you can do Lackman test in such patients. Okay. And the Lackman test will be positive. The radiograph will may show may show many findings. There can be arthrosis. Okay. The medial eminence can get entrapped into it. So arthroscopic assisted reduction is needed. Type 1 McKeever can be managed conservatively. Type 2 McKeever can be managed by aspiration of hematros and putting a long leg cast. Type 3 McKeever needs operative intervention. How will you operate on type 3 McKeever? Uh, sir, with the headless screws? Um, headless screws or the headless screws? Okay, you don't have headless screws. Then what? what else you can do? If 4 mm cancel screws bury the head. You cannot use threads. Threads. Uh, sir, we can use. Can you use threads? Okay, you can yes. pass out, pass the threads or or suture material through this with two holes and and stitch it over here outside. Otherwise, yes. you can do arthrex technique. Okay. In arthritis, techniques, also the, the 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 artificial threads are uh, uh, are employed and the fracture is reduced. For this, arthroscopy is mandatory because the needle uh, meniscus is sometimes entrapped. Okay, so type one is unmanaged uh, conservatively. Type two is aspirated and then redo X-ray if it's reduced or not reduced. If it's reduced, you can do long leg cast. Type 3 and type 2 non reduced fractures can be treated operatively as arthroscopic assisted. So, complications are stiffness, loss of extension, anterior, uh, late anterior instability, and malunion. Uh, remember, the, the there is one this uh, type 2 McKeever if managed non. Uh, effectively there is a loss of terminal extension and if there is loss of terminal extension in these patients uh, you can go out you can do arthroscopically um, enlarge the trochlear group because they can also cause cyclop type of lesions and reduce the terminal extension uh, so zahed new tubal tube tubal tubercle so yes, how sir. you classify tibial tubercle is by Ogden classification. Type 1 is through tibial tuberosity. Type 2 yes, is ossification center of tibial tuberosity and proximal tibia. And type 3 are through the proximal tibia ossification center. And they are divided into A and B, displaced or undisplaced. So this is the classification system. Okay. And the intervention is that most of the times you have to fix these fractures, avoiding the pisces. Yes, sir. Uh, this, these fractures are uh, the, in age group of 14 to 16. Uh, predisposing factors are patella baja, uh, tight hamstrings, and history of osteoarthritis syndrome. So, for this also, type 3 needs ORIF plus arthroscopic evaluation. Okay, tibial tuberosity fractures can cause compartmental syndrome. How it causes compartmental syndrome? Well, they should not. <laughs> <laughs> Why they should not? 
Okay. So this is a, a testable question. Anterior tibial recurrent artery tethered or torn as it enters the anterior compartment from the trifurcation posteriorly. See the diagrams and check the anterior tibial recurrent artery where it is positioned. When it is tethered or torn, it can increase the compartmental pressure and cause anterior compartmental syndrome. Patellar fractures, uh, I will not go through patellar fractures, but the, they can be transverse fractures, community fractures, avulsion fractures, osteoporotic fractures, and uh, most of them are managed conservatively if not displaced. And in importance, patellar sleeve fractures, which are uh, notorious and uh, um, involved in the pediatric population and, and difficult to identify. So, patellar sleeve fractures are exclusively in children, usually the distal pole osteochondral aversion injury of with articular cartilage, there is hemarthrosis, there is a palpable gap and patella alta and the patient is unable to do SLR. Do check the fracture, uh, patella sleeve fractures radiograph in the, on, on Google and uh, check how difficult they are to identify. Okay. There is a patient, it, he came to me with a dis proximal uh, tibial metaphysical fracture which was treated conservatively and after, uh, for the left side, and after six months, the patient is having this deformity. What's this deformity is called? Uh, Jahan Zeb, can you answer this? Um, the valgus deformity, sir? Yes, but what is this deformity called? Well, is this deformity uh, uh, after proximal left tibia fracture? There is a name for it. The wing swept deformity, like something. No, no, no. Wing swept deformity is it's when there is a bilateral bilateral deformity. If there is a vulgus on one side, the varus on the other side, and yeah. I, I see an X ray, then I can say it's wing swept. This is only one deformity in the left tibia. If you see, and it's vulgus deformity. What is it called? Okay, it's called Cousin phenomena. Cousin fracture. Anyone knows it? No, sir. No. So, what is Cousin phenomena? Proximal tibial metaphysical fractures are significant for the tendency to develop a late vulgus deformity. Etiology is vulgus deformity is unknown, and this is known as Cousin fracture or phenomena. Uh, remember that vulgus deformity do resolve conservatively, but the shortening remains. Okay? Yes, sir. So, Cousin phenomena is maybe observed 12 to 24 months with expectation of spontaneous correction. Patients should be counseled, parents should be counseled in advance. If you have proximal tibial metaphysical fracture in five to seven years old child, you are doing a cast, you have to inform them that there are deformity which can happen, which is beyond your control. So, etiology, these are all assumptions. Etiology is one is incomplete reduction. Type 2, the another etiology is concomitant injury for the proximal tibial physis. Either there is infolded periosteum or either there is injury to the pes and sarianus with a loss of proximal tibial physis tether leading to asymmetrical excessive growth. Okay. The treatment is mostly conservative. If your deformity fails to resolve, you can do operative intervention, but I've never seen any operative intervention. And the treatment is medial heavy disease in skeletal immature patient. Okay. You put the hemiphysiodesis with the lateral side to grow, and the valgus will correct with the passage of time. And you can do corrective osteotomy also. Ankle fractures are classified into dias and taktijin. It's a modification of uh, Laghans and classification and ad addition of salt and harris. So type 1 is supination inversion. Okay. Type 2 is pronation aversion. Type 3 is supination plantar flexion. And type 4 is supination external rotation. You will remember this classification? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. yes, it's sir. just like Laghans and a bit different. If you don't remember this classification, this does not matter. In your exam, they will not ask you this uh, uh, DIAS classification. Uh, if there is a, you reduce the fracture, and if it's less than 22 mm articular displacement, you do the cast immobilization and manage conservatively. 
Operative intervention, you can do close induction percutaneous spinning or ORIF. If more than 2 mm displays intraarticular fracture, irreducible fractures, or inter, uh, you, you can do open reduction if there is interposed periosteum, tendons, or neurovascular structures. They can show you an x ray and tell you that your close reduction was attempted or was not reducible. So you remember the interposed periosteum always in the exam. Okay. Transition fracture, telox, and triplant fractures. So, who will tell me what type of fracture is this? Sir, Salter Harris type 3. Salter Harris type uh, 4 fracture. Uh, type three. 4 and type 3. No. Uh, 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 type 2. How many fractures you can see? This is only one fracture. And it is type, Salter Harris type 3 fracture. Which part of the tibia is involved? Medial or lateral? Uh, lateral, sir. Lateral. What is attached to this bone piece? Uh, what, what ligament is attached to it? Anterior and posterior tibiofibular ligaments. Okay. Anterior, inferior tibiofibular ligaments. Okay. Deltoid is attached to the medial side here. We yes. talk, we talk about here. So this is called telox fracture. Okay, evolution fracture anterior inferior tibial ligament. Okay, what is the uh, uh, mechanism? Mostly external rotation is the mechanism. How will you fix it if it's displaced? How will you fix this one? Be, uh, it can be fixed uh, using a smooth K wire. Okay, um, um, you will do the K wire like this or this. Your implant should be like this or this or where? Yes, sir. Into the metaphysis. Okay, you can do it, but the problem is that you will injure the physis. So, mostly the construct is crossing in the epiphysis. You can put a cortical screw through this. Okay, uh, if it's like this. Where is the fibula? Huh? Here. This is a CT scan image. The fibula uh, uh, will come later on. <laughs> it's an <interesting laughs> aspect. It, okay. means, the, means how to fix it in the in the presence of fibula? How how you put the wire in this portion? Uh, if you if you if you palpate your uh, knee, uh, no no no, I'm not I'm not joking. If you palpate your ankle, always the fibula is posteriorly placed then. You get yes. it. <laughs> okay. So normally yes, people are send the smotic screws. Okay. They can ask you how you do send the smotic screw, and uh, it is 20 degree anterior. Your starting point is posterior on the fibula, and you go anterior okay. 20 degree to the imaginary line. Okay. okay. Basically, the tibia is anterior. Fibula is posterior. The okay. I, I don't have. I cannot draw it uh, because I don't have anything to draw. But basically, the set is good. So try to understand the fact that tibia is more anterior. This fragment can be easily fixed percutaneously also. Okay? But you can do it open if it's undisplaced. If it's undisplaced. Okay. If it's displaced, okay. you do ORIF for this patient. This fracture. Okay. So regarding TLOX fracture, it's a Salteres type 3 fracture of the listening tibial physis caused by the emergence of anterior inferior tibial fibular ligament, mechanism external rotation. And typically occur one year of complete distal tibial physial closure. These patients are older than triplant fracture age group. Okay. Okay. And there is a there is no fracture of posterior distal tibial metaphysis in the corner. And this distribution distinguishes from triplant. Okay. So if, if you can do open rational fixation if more than two mm of displacement, okay. And uh, close direction you can do by internal rotation under general anesthesia and percutaneous fixation can be done. Arthroscopic assisted reduction has been described. Okay. So this is your triplant fracture. Okay. Is distal tibial metaphysical fracture involving the growth plate and epiphysis? You will need to have a CT scan for this patient to identify the fracture components. I didn't. I missed one diagram 
to make you understand this is how the structure is going. Uh, basically, triplant fracture is a sulfurous type 2 core fracture. And uh, try to understand that this happens in younger population than telox fracture. The reason for this fracture is that distal phasal ossification centers are different. First, uh, uh, physal closure is central, then is medial, and then is lateral. Okay? So, the lateral, which is the telox, are older population. And these are for the younger population, one or two years younger. So mostly the, the lateral triplan is, uh, there, there is a, ex, uh, it, lateral triplan has also been described as well. Okay. And the treatment is the same, less than two mm displacement can be treated conservatively. Otherwise you can go for operative intervention. Um, close reduction can be, is possible or, or if, Technique is epiphyseal screw placed parallel to the physis. So we, we just have a review of pediatric population. Remember that the, some aspects that you consider the age while managing any fracture. You remember that the physis is involved or not involved and how the physis can remodel very nicely. And remember the physiology of the bone and plastic deformation. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Thank you.